RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. It's always great to be here in the Council Chambers with the Mayor of RPV, Mayor Ken Dida. Great to have you back here. You're Thank here you. A lot. <laughs> it's always great to be with you too. And happy summer and happy Fourth of July weekend. Yes, it's coming on very soon. And we want to invite the public, right, for the Fourth of July, the big event over at City Hall. It's a big event from 11 to 5. Uh, there's going to be entertainment, music. Uh, there are going to be all kinds of booths for information. There's going to be kiddie rides. Uh, uh, arts and crafts. I mean, it's a great event. It's going to last from 11 to 5. And if you don't come, you're going to miss something spectacular. Right. It's truly a wonderful tradition in the community. Everybody comes together. I think there's thousands of people that will come that day. We get somewhere between three and 4,000 people. Right. And visit. they're all coming to see you, hopefully, maybe in the pie eating contest or something like that. <laughs> pie on your you'll face, have to. You'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, we look forward to that. It's going to be very, very exciting. And just a great way, again, we love to bring the community together whenever we can. It, it works that way very nicely, and it's a good event, good, yes. Good, um, So, God, to, moving on to what's happening with City Council and in the city, you always bring us up to date. Top priority always is the safety of the community. So tell us the latest, what's happening on the crime front, prevention efforts, and, of course, there was a town hall that was held here with the Sheriff's Department, a public safety town hall. That's correct. Well... July 1st is going to start the work to install all the ALRPs. All three cities have signed up on it, uh, so it's moving forward, and that's going to be a significant improvement in the tools that the sheriff has uh, for crime prevention. And those are the cameras that will recognize license plates? Those are the specifically recognized license plates. However, uh, the city is looking into, with the cooperation of the sheriff's department, on vetting a number of companies put other kinds of TV cameras on that will record and will be able to transmit to the sheriff's department. Uh, it's not going to be instantaneous, but there will be a record and we'll have even that much more information. Uh, initially, they'll be available for the homeowners around the perimeter. Uh, the homeowners within can also uh, take advantage of that. We don't know what the cost will be and all of that yet, but the city is looking into that to provide that to the people. Yeah, and of course, again, the city council's focus to add more resources and revenues um, to do crime prevention because we've seen sort of the trend where we had an uptick in burglaries and there's a shift, but we always need to be like mindful, as you say, see something, say something, just be alert what's happening in our neighborhoods because they're not as safe as they used to be, but we're still pretty safe. Well, we're still one of the safest cities in Southern California, but that doesn't mean we have to sit back on our laurels. That means we have to be ever vigilant, continue the process, make sure we know what's happening, and ALRPs will give us a handle on that so that we can adjust our security forces uh, appropriately. And the, the best thing you can do that came out at the, uh, the town safety, hall. safety Town Hall was that it was an education of how to harden the site. Because if you harden your site, the criminal is going to look for the soft one. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how you start protecting yourself. And we learned a lot about that. Uh, the other thing that we have to remember is we're paying for the sheriff's department. They are your police force. Call them. Don't be afraid. If you see something, don't say, well, I'm not sure. That's not your job. Call the sheriff's department. They're anxious, they're willing, and they need your help. Right. And um, so that's good to know. And also just, you know, get involved with Neighborhood Watch in your community. And, you know, every neighborhood has, has a Neighborhood Watch in, in the entire city. It's a very active program. It is an active program. And homeowners associations can actually call the sheriff and have the sheriff come and visit them and discuss their issues with them. So. Uh, the Sheriff is and, and the uh, Neighborhood Watch program are both good programs. Use them. That's what they're there for. Okay. And also, sign up for Volunteers on Patrol, right? We're still looking for those? Yeah, we can always use <laughs> Volunteers on Patrol. You'll be trained and you'll get a nice white car to patrol the city and 
actually what you do is you provide some more eyes on the situation. You're not going to confront uh, burglars and, and get into a, you know, Western movie shootout kind of thing. But it's an extra set of eyes, and that's very, very helpful. Well, thank you for that update. Um, one big, you know, thing, the last council meeting, of course, was the adoption of the budget for 2016-17, correct? You guys, that goes into effect July 1st, and we're fiscally sound in our PV. We are very fiscally sound. We managed to adopt the budget on time, so it can take effect without any uh, mechanism to extend things. We're doing that. But the big thing is the format for the budget has been changed rather dramatically. For the better. Uh, uh -huh. Always for the better. In the past, you had large blocks of uh, data and large organizations, and you really couldn't tell how and where the money was being spent. This time, the CIP budget is by project. Which is capital improvement. It's a capital improvement program. It's by project, and it identifies how much it's going to cost, when it's going to be done, and we're going to start doing that rather religiously rather than just letting things slide and kicking the can down the road. And the other thing it does is identify the sources of the money. Most people don't realize that a lot of the money that's used for that are restricted funds. They are proposition monies, uh, all sorts of monies. And actually, those monies make up the bulk of our budget. But now we will know what's paying for what, where it's coming from, and the council can make fully informed decisions. The general fund will still be doing things like uh, the personnel in the city, the employees, the sheriff's department, and things like that. But it's broken down to the point that we have much better visibility. It's on the website. It provides visibility for the people. It's part of our transparency goal so you know exactly what we're paying for and where it's coming from. You know, it's right. a good, it's a great improvement. When you mentioned transparency, just go on, I always push the city's website, rpvca.gov. You can go in the finance department. You, everything is right there for you. You can see where the dollars are going, where the dollars are coming from. Now you'll actually see it in more detail than you did before. OpenGov sort of gave you an overview. Uh, with what we've got in the budget now, when you pick that up and look at it, you'll be able to go down almost by line item. And also that we have a very healthy reserve in the city, right? Yes, we have a reserve. Uh, in fact, we have a surplus over our reserve. The council policy is to have a 50% reserve of our general fund. And uh, currently a $3,000 reserve on a CIP, council's talking about perhaps increasing that uh, when we look at ex escalating costs. But uh, over, we have uh, about a million two over and above uh, the, res the actual city council mandated reserve. So we're in good shape. Uh, Got to compliment the staff and also the council should take credit because it looks very carefully how we're spending money. Uh, we make decisions as a council and we're very mindful of where we spend the money. People may disagree with us, but it's different on the other side of the dais. What are some of the bigger expenses in the city? It's, it's staff, it's... Well, the, big, the bigger expenses are public safety, as it should be. That's priority number one. Uh, the other big expense that uh, comes out of the general fund is the personnel, the employees. Uh, then there's a, a large expenditure coming from all manner of sources, which is our infrastructure, roads, Portuguese Bend, and all those kinds of things. Uh, because we are in such good financial shape, the council decided not to reinstate the storm drain user fee. Don't need it's it. It's sunsetted in uh, June, right? It's so sunsetted, and, we're, and the council decided not to extend it or start a new one. We don't need it. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, anything else you want to say. It's quite a process going through the budget. I know you have workshops, and there's you know there's a lot that goes into getting that passed. And it takes a lot of work. Uh, we get a lot of input directly from the finance department, which we look at so that when we get into a workshop, we know the right questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Going in cold, you don't really get that chance. And that makes the workshop very effective because we've had a chance to look at the draft. 
then look at the questions we need to explore. And then when we have the workshop, it makes it a lot more efficient because we can go down the list of things we need to explore. And how about getting input from the community when you're looking at that? There's the Financial oh, advisory, yes. Finance Advisory Committee. We get it from the, from the Financial Advisory Committee and uh, our residents are not reluctant in sending emails to the council members about their view on a particular subject on the budget. And that's a good thing. It gives us a measure of what the community is looking to do. Okay, on that note, well, you get a lot of community input, which is good. We're a very proactive and oh, yes. intelligent community here in RPV. Um, during public comments all the time, if you watch council meetings, you kind of see the people coming back, the issues that aren't going. And one of those issues is what's happening with the soil at Ladera Linda playing fields. It's been, it, it's, a, it's complex, not necessarily complicated. So tell us how the city's involved with that issue where there's, supposedly possibly contamination of soil at the Ladera Linda fields which are operated by the school district. Does that make well, sense? Well, <laughs> we get so much conflicting data. Uh, various groups have looked at various things and come back with all sorts of different data and therefore different conclusions. Unfortunately, the school district uh, has not been as forthcoming as I think they could have been to eliminate all that speculation. Uh, there right, so for viewers watching that don't know exactly what's going, could you just summarize yeah, in a nutshell just the, what, how the, it all played out? The, the problem was that the AYSO has a contract with the school district to operate some fields for their soccer. They wanted to clear some fields, a level them out, and that sort of thing. So they imported some dirt. They and did those not, fields that is, is they, at Ladera Linda, which at is Lada, This is primarily Ladera Linda, although some of that dirt was also delivered to other uh, school sites. Okay. Uh, but the, the main problem is getting the actual facts about Ladera Linda. Um, they claim that it came from a couple of properties, um, and yet when you look at the uh, uh, overhead picture of how many loads are, you get to wonder how many how much dirt was taken from those properties or did it come from somewhere else? Um, there's been anecdotal data about things, uh, contaminants in there, but it's all anecdotal. There of course, were, it is roped up with signs that say asbestos. Right now, yes. Uh, and uh, But what we're waiting for is the there is an independent company that's doing an in-depth review and testing of the soils. We're waiting for that to come. In the meantime, the council has asked that uh, the city manager and I get together with the uh, school superintendent and the president of the board uh, to sit down and see if we can enter into a dialogue that would clear up some of the contradictory stuff we're hearing. Try and get the real facts out, uh, make it as transparent as possible, uh, and see if we can get some cooperation to address the issues in our city. Um, there's some question as to whether this is really falls into an educational element for which the school, a, the school district is exempt from dealing with the city or whether it doesn't. And if it doesn't, to what extent the city needs to get involved. But those issues hopefully will be addressed when we meet. And that meeting is being set up as we speak. Since we're at, focused on the Ladera Linda playing fields area, that brings me to my next, moving on to the next subject, which is up there in the preserve behind there. There have been coyote sightings. We're hearing about more of these in the community. And residents are worried. I have to admit, me and my husband were out hiking, and we saw two. Um, what do you want residents to know? Because it's the population of the coyotes are managed by the county. Yes, the county. Uh, uh, animal control really uh, has the jurisdiction over those. We don't. The uh, best thing is to try and avoid them. Don't let your small children or small pets out alone. Uh, you cite coyotes, call animal control or call the city and we'll call animal control. And animal control's policy is they will attempt to trap and if they trap, they euthanize. Because you can't relocate them. No. So they're euthanized. And that's basically to cull the population somewhat and get it so it's acceptable. Now, uh, you know, euthanizing them, I'm, 
I know it, it's a sensitive issue with some people, mm -hmm. but we have to decide on safety first. Right. And so I know that we at one point did a story at RPV TV about that. If you do see one, you know, you're supposed to act large and noisy. And that's exactly yes. what my husband did. And they, it, it scooted off. But, yes. But I definitely, they are, they are more visible. And so um, more news on the preserve though, since we're, we're looking into that area um, right now. First of all, the city council and the Land Conservancy had a meeting to discuss a signage, a signage plan in the preserve. Talk about what that's all about. Yes, the uh, Land Conservancy went and looked at a whole bunch of design, sign designs and presented them to the council. Uh, Councilwoman Brooks made a suggestion that uh, some of the taller signs to make the uh, signage more visible and readable to read it vertically top down right. with the name, uh, which was a good su suggestion. Uh, my concern was that some of the signs sit there and they recite municipal codes about what you're supposed to do and don't do. People don't read those. I suggested they put, instead of bullet points of municipal codes, which may be required, and you put that in the bottom in a small mm -hmm. element, but do's and don'ts, do this, don't do that, in a short sentence that somebody will actually read because the sign has no value if nobody reads it. The other thing that was uh, council indicated that once we design on a kind of sign we're gonna have in the preserve to basically brand all our open space to use the same conceptual design in all our parks as we change the signs. We're not gonna go there and change them all right now, uh, but as they need to be changed, we will change them to the new standard. And these are going to be signs throughout the 1,500 acre preserve, that for the preserve? It's, these will be for the preserve, but it'll go beyond the preserve to all our other parks in time. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have one, one consistent design of signs. So when, as a timeline, when, when might we see signs in the preserve? Is it still a while away? Or? Uh, we indicated to them the kinds of changes we'd want to make. We haven't heard back as to what's going to happen okay. with that, but I see that happening rather soon. Okay. Also, what will happen very soon, July 1st, we have in the preserve, it's going to be our sheriffs now patrolling. Talk about the decision to add sheriff's deputies that will patrol the preserve rather than the rangers we were using prior. Okay. With the sheriffs there, they're going to spend a full shift. There will be two sheriffs. They have been trained. They've completed their training and they will replace uh, the uh, ranger at a tool cost that's less, actually. Uh, and it has some advantages. Being sworn officers, they can issue citations where a ranger is somewhat limited. Uh, in the event of an emergency, we've got two extra sworn deputies to deal with that. Plus the fact being a sheriff's deputy, frankly, is a bit more intimidating than a ranger. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully what we can do is encourage people to Preserve the preserve for their future generations. It's something that you don't want to sit there and abuse. Right, with such a jewel in the community and, oh, yeah. and the fact that the city and the Land Conservancy co-manage this together and it's... Yep. Uh, and the social media has made it a, a, almost a destination point. Uh, I, think I go to church on Sundays to St. John Fisher on Crest and Crenshaw. And lately, I've been seeing all sorts of cars parked on the streets. In fact, even a bus. And in research, it, I find it that there are groups that come park there on a public street, bring a bus with a bunch, and they go hiking the preserve. So it's become something as a destination for just about all of Southern of course, California. The, the council and the, they did address the parking situation up there. It's limited, so the public. You're, you are in the protecting some for the neighborhood. No, in the neighborhoods in Del Cerro and those places, yeah. Uh, we've done permit parking because it got so bad that people couldn't get out of their driveways. Uh, so, yes, we've limited there. But the other public streets like Crenshaw and right. Crest, uh, those are public streets. Uh, they impact traffic, but they don't really impact the neighborhood to the point of preventing Neighbors, neighbors from getting in and out we of there. We've been discovered. We say this every time we're here. And I yes. think as uh, Councilwoman Brooks likes to say, we've become Los Angeles's playground. 
understandably because people, this is a beautiful area to come, to hike, to bike, to yep. relax. Yep. Go to Trump, go to Terranea, it's all there. Yes, we have created a little paradise that everybody wants to share with us. Right. It was paradise when you became mayor 40 plus years ago and it's still paradise. We created that paradise in 73 when we took local control away from a county 30 miles away, which wasn't sensitive to our needs, and started our own local control. This past January, the council voted 5-0 to oppose a backdoor change in our zoning by what the state wanted to do in the housing element in our general plan. And I argued at that time, you know, we, we spent three years to get local control from the county 30 miles away. There's no point in capitulating and giving it to the state 400 miles away. Right. You're on it. Um, we're talking about the fact that we are the playground for Los Angeles, and one of the spots people love to come is Abalone Cove. Just a quick announcement, what's going on there. There's been a closure because down in Abalone Cove to an area because of there's been some falling rock and, and all of that. Explain what people need to know about their safety down there. Okay, there, there are two kinds of closures there. The one is an area where a uh, fissure has occurred and there are rocks falling down by the tide pools in that area. Uh, yeah, in, in that area, by the tide pools. And we just closed it off because it's a hazard. You're there leaning over the tide pool, and before you know it, you get hit on the head with a rock. And, and not a pebble. I'm talking about rocks. Uh, so you want to protect the people from that. And until we find a solution to that, it's going to stay closed. But we had a more recent closure of other areas, mostly because of high surf. Right. And those, that will happen intermittently through the summer, and those high yes. surf advisories happen. Yep. Um, we know what happens down there in, uh, off the tide poles. It's yep. like a washing machine effect. And yes. so it's all about safety. Fun, but you have to have safety is first. Safety is first. We don't, <laughs> uh, you don't want anybody getting hurt. Come right. on. Right. Um, we, at your council meeting uh, that you just had here in June, um, you voted on a municipal code amendment to streamline the process for dealing with city trees that might impair views. So they're city trees that, again, impair views. What is that all about? Like, why did you need to do that? Well, it was split between a number of departments, and what we've done is consolidated it to one department. That simplifies it right there. We've also given some guidelines as to what we're going to do. Uh, the primary goal is city trees to get views will be trimming. There will be times when a tree would have to be removed. However, if that does occur, there will be a recommended replacement tree. Uh, we don't want to denude the peninsula, but one of the things that everybody values and pays anywhere from 12 to 15% premium on their taxes for is the view. Right. It's an economic thing. If they're going to pay for the view, they should have it. If you take the view away, try and get the tax reduced. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So the object then is to get that. And we worked hard. It took us a long time until 1989 to get a view res preservation restoration ordinance that would pass muster with the Constitution. And we want to keep it. Right. So the need to do this, so to streamline the process, how did it work before it just wasn't? I just, you, know, you, you call into the uh, city public works department. Somebody will go out, take pictures, review it and bring back a recommendation as to what to do with the tree, and then that will be done. Simple. It's, it, it's a simple process. It's, it's not as convoluted as it used to be. Okay. Um, on other improvements in the city, uh, the council discussed there were plans in the works to make improvements at Lower Hess Park, and now that project's going back out to bid. Uh, explain what's going on with that. Well, there were two projects that went out to bid for improvements. One was at Ladera Linda and one was at Hess Park. Uh, the council rejected the bids and sent them back because the bids went beyond what the neighbors had agreed to with the council. Uh, there was some miscommunication apparently because the RFPs went out to redo a lot of things that were already decided. In Ladera Linda, they were going to have some more uh, neighborhood meetings. Uh, those were all done, decisions were made. So there was some miscommunication and they were rejected and those RFPs are being rewritten and sent out for rebid 
to reflect what the neighbors really wanted. Which is what you're trying to, council's listening. You hear what the neighbors are yes. saying. They wanted a passive park in the lower, for the improvements As Councilwoman Brooks said, less is more. All right, it's summertime fun, right? Here we are, summer's here. If we just mentioned 4th of July festival coming up and all that. Um, what are some of the great things you like that the city offers to the community just to really enjoy the summer even that much more in our PV? Well, we've had an ongoing program that's always been published in our newsletter. Uh, it forecasts what's going to be done for the next quarter, and so I suggest people read it. Read the newsletter. Read the newsletter, especially page one where you see what council actions are. That'll keep you in tune. But a new thing came up, and that was not a new thing. It's been done before, but it's been expanded, and that's movies in the park. Uh, unfortunately, there were uh, just a small number of people that thought it would be a great idea for Ladera Linda when the people in the Homes Association got there because of their proximity around that park, uh, they came on very strongly saying, do you know that this is going to impact us? Do you really want, we don't want that impact. So what the council did at this point, until we can look at that in a lot more depth, we've canceled the Ladera and the movies in the park. Okay. So that's gone. If you go on the website again, it lists where they're happening. You go on a website, there's on a Hess Park, there's a PVIC. Uh, I don't remember. I think all on June 15th, it's uh, or July 15th, it's a drive-in the park, and they it's they're going to be showing the movie Cars. I think that was Could the 15th. Be. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with all they're doing. I know. There's there's all kinds of great programs, and one thing I want to mention, I participated in yoga in the park free every mm -hmm. Tuesday at um, Ryan Park. Uh -huh. And uh, it's in the shade under the trees. All ages were welcome. And uh, the instructor actually works part-time in Rec and Park, Gretchen. She's fabulous. Uh -huh. So we need to get you down there on your mat, Ken, in between all your meetings. Well, <laughs> I, you know, so I'll tell you. Could you take a pause? I, right now, as busy as I, I am, I do have some free time. All right. It's been between 2 and 3 a.m. every second Thursday. So okay. call me. <laughs> We'll do it. We'll do it. No, it's really. Yeah. It's, now I'm going to get calls at yeah, 2 a.m. It's um, no, it's it's great um, that it is also free, but it's all about yes. our, the city is working hard to have what's called a healthy RPV to help keep residents fit. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, the city has all sorts of programs to do that, uh, and in the park facilities, they they put uh, the trails for the seniors to walk and take exercises. And it, we're trying to reach out. To the entire community, not to just one segment. Right. We're wrapping it up here. Any extra mayor's announcements that you want? Um, just we want to have, make sure everyone's having a good time out there at summertime. Well, I think enjoy it. If you can, watch the city council meetings on TV. Uh, you can either watch them that night or when they're rebroadcast. But if you don't have the time, read the newsletter. We have now added on the front page. Council actions, the, the bigger ones, not the little ones, but the bigger ones that we feel people would be most interested in. And it's just a short sentence of what it is, and a sentence or two is what was decided. But it gives you a clue if that's something you're interested, you can go to the website and you can read the entire uh, staff report, or you can actually tune in on the video and see what the council thinks of it. This is one way you'll know more about what's going on in the city and you won't be subject to overexcitement due to rumors. Right, well, there's a lot happening and we know you don't, you're right there with all the facts and figures. That's what we, we enjoy about you. Well, <laughs> facts and figures. That, uh, hey, that's, uh, that's what I'm into. Right, well, thank you so much, Mayor Dida, for all you're doing for the community, being here and uh, we'll see you back here in August. And yes. you can update us again on what's going on. Well, it's my pleasure because it's an opportunity to explore some of the things we're doing in more depth and, and some of the reasons behind what we're doing than you can get just from the newspaper. All right. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson here with Mayor Dida. Have a great day out there. Thanks for watching.